well, the mic works. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this Curly Center conversation with Jim Bazinski. Um, just a word about format. Uh, tonight, we're going to run this as we often do with uh, Curly Center conversations. That is, I'm going to introduce Jim. He's going to speak for a little while, tell us a little bit about his story and, and issues and uh, um, stories that matter to him. And then I'm going to open it up, uh, just throwing some questions out to him. We're going to talk for a little while, and then we'll open it up to you. And, and hopefully, as you uh, listen to us, you'll be inspired to uh, come up with uh, some of your own questions. Um, I'm particularly happy to, to have Jim here tonight, um, partly because um, he's a Penn Stater, and uh, this is his first time back on campus in decades, and it's, it's great to have this day and get this chance to show him around. Also because um, we're going to talk about uh, the website that he co-founded, Outsports, and I really think uh, part of the Curly Center's mission is, that's really important is to talk about social issues of the day as they relate to sports, because we sincerely believe that one of the ways um, American society works out social issues is through athletics. And so um, we're, we're always glad to get the chance to talk about those kinds of issues. So let me uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jim. He's from Wilkes-Barre. Do you say Wilkes-Barre or Wilkes-Barre? Wilkes-Barre. Wilkes-Barre. He's a Wilkes-Barre native, 1980 uh, Penn State grad. His first job was the Belfont Bureau Chief uh, for the CDT. <laughs> And uh, he uh, rose to the ranks at the CDT and then moved on to Pasadena and to Long Beach, where he was the, the, in California, the sports editor in both of those places. At the time, he was one of only two gay sports editors in the country. And then, uh, as he'll tell you, in 1999, he co-founded Outsports, which is the world's largest um, website dedicated to gay and lesbian athletes. It is, in its own uh, self-described way, the galactic leader in, uh, in gay sports. So um, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. Um, we couldn't be more current, uh, given what's going on in the state of Indiana yeah. right now. But uh, Jim, why don't you take it away and, and tell us a little bit about how you, how you got where you got and uh, how you found the site. Well, I want to thank everyone for bringing the snow to uh, someone from Los Angeles. It's been a long time since I saw it. And I want to thank John uh, Affleck for having me here. It was it's a wonderful invitation, and I've had a great time on campus. I used to live over at Hamilton, Hamilton Hall, and I tweeted my, or sent, texted my ex-boyfriend and I, who lived at Hamilton Hall, a picture yesterday. He now lives four houses down from me in LA with his husband, so that's something about a relationship that we're still that close. But um, it was kind of memories remembered back, me back at Hamilton Hall. And I remember a journalism professor, uh, when I was at Penn State, took me aside one day and said, uh, he advised me to get out of journalism because I'm never going to amount to anything. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I took his advice or else I wouldn't be here. But on the other hand, I guess maybe I wish I had taken his advice and I'd be, have gone into a lot more lucrative field in journalism and you'd be, I'd be here having a, a building named after me as opposed to just giving a, a talk. So. Um, this has been a great university, and I just, you know, Pennsylvania native, so um, still a big Nittany Lion fan, and just really happy to be here. And what's interesting, I'll give you a little bit of my background in, at Penn State, because my first sort of inkling of how the issue of, say, homosexuality broadly in sports had an impact was when I was a junior and took a sociology class, and we had a guest speaker from Cal Berkeley named Alan Dundas, who was a world famous folklorist. And he had written a paper that basically was called Football as a Homoerotic Ritual. And it was all about the terminology you know, you have the end zone, you have to get in the end zone, you have to score, you have the quarterback with his hands underneath of the center's butt. It was all this was written as an anthropologist, like looking from the outside. And he included that it was a way for men to have homosexual experiences in a sort of socially sanctioned way. And it kind of blew my mind to sort of think of it a bit that way. And he gave the lecture, and it was loaded with Penn State football players at this lecture hall. And I thought they were going to maybe go up and lynch the guy because it was like, are you calling us gay, you know? And he tried to explain, he's just speaking academically. But it was one of those early signs that was like, wow, this issue really, this really hits people kind of, you know, 
in a really close place? Like, what was it about the idea that you might have gay athletes that made these people really uncomfortable? And so I kind of always laid in the background of my mind for years. I started, I said I was the Belfon Bureau Chief, which was a bureau of one, uh, but it was a nice fancy title to have. And I was a news reporter, and I covered the county courthouse, and then moved on to the news desk, became a assistant city editor, and for a while that was the food editor, which was really bizarre. And I had fun being the food editor. One issue it was all about vegetarian uh, Thanksgiving, and the next issue before Thanksgiving was, you know, how to have venison Thanksgiving. So I kind of like, I kind of had fun with the meat eaters and the non-meat eaters. But uh, the CDT was a great place to work. Uh, it was owned by Knight Ritter, and they had papers out in California. And I wanted a lifestyle change and moved to the big city. So I moved to LA in 1985 and got a job at the Pasadena Star News on their news desk. After a year, they had an opening for a sports editor, and they asked me to do it. And I've always knew sports, but I had never done that before, so that was my first job. And one of my colleagues is a guy named Chuck Culpepper, who is now the college football writer for the Washington Post. He's been with, the, uh, been with a lot of places. He worked for the LA Times for a while, USA Today. But Chuck is openly gay now. He came out publicly about four years ago after the AFC Championship game. Um, right around the time Jason Collins came out. But I knew Chuck back then, and I knew Chuck was gay, but he didn't know I, it was one of the things, I knew he was gay, he didn't know I was gay, and we just kind of reconnected in the last couple of years, because he moved back from uh, overseas with his partner, since you can now uh, basically marry your partner if they live overseas for a while. He lived all over the place, because you couldn't, if you had a, a, a foreign-born spouse, you basically were not allowed to marry them in this country or get benefits. So, um, so kind of even back then, there was this subcurrent of it. In 87, I moved on to the Long Beach Press-Telegram as their sports editor. Um, and I was out to the staff. I mean, some of the staff, it was kind of a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. Um, I didn't care who knew, but I didn't sort of broadcast it. And I said, I want to come out to everybody, so this is not something whispered out. So in 1990, I was playing in the gay games, which was a athletic sporting event designed for gay and lesbians, but pretty much anybody can join, and it was in Vancouver. And my team, I had a flag football team that was going. It was the first time they had flag football in the gay games, and we had t-shirts. And so at the office, I went all over the newsroom and sold t-shirts, and when people would ask why, I'd said it's to fund my team in the gay games. And everybody I asked bought a shirt, and that was sort of the way I came out. It was like very natural. And after then, my staff was fascinated with the whole subject of who was gay. And our, the beat reporters would come back from the Dodgers, the Raiders, Rams, Angels, Lakers, and trying to tell me who they thought were the gay players on the team. And they had this habit of trying to tell me who had the biggest penis on all the teams, as if that was something I was fascinated by. And they would report back, and it was kind of like, OK, I, I, I don't have a one-track mind. I am interested in them as, as athletes. But to me, it was actually a very good sign that they were comfortable enough with their boss to sort of talk about that kind of stuff. And we ran an early story on gays and sports back in the early 90s when no one else did because they were kind of open-minded about it and treated the subject with respect and not with any kind of like weirdness. Um, so again, like even then, I thought the story generated a lot of comments in, in the Long Beach area because no one had ever done that before. And I left the paper in 98 and took a year's sabbatical just to, you know, figure out what I was going to do next. And a couple years earlier, I had met Sid Ziegler, who's now my business partner, uh, on the flag football team. And um, he's unfortunately a huge Patriots fan, and I'm a huge Peyton Manning fan, so we, had, we really bonded over our kind of hatred for each other's teams, and we started watching football together, and he's obsessed with it as I am. And we were out Cape Cod one uh, summer on vacation, and it was like 1999. Why don't we start a website, which was, the web then was kind of, I mean, it did what, not what it is now. Yeah, it was there, but it was pretty basic. And there was no such things as blog, Google hadn't been invented yet, Facebook clearly not, Twitter. And so we said, OK, what's, you know, what do you have to do to start a website? And basically, you went on and you found some free service that would give you a template, the ugliest layout ever. But we decided, let's write, a, let's write about sports as gay guys. And we called it, we wanted to call it gay sports, but that was taken by somebody who didn't do much with the domain name. And we took out sports, which is actually is a great name because it doesn't say gay immediately, so, but it had a nice little you know, ring to it. 
except there have been Chinese sportswear manufacturers, I think we're an outdoors firm, so they will write us occasionally wanting to see if they can do our orders for our latest equipment gear. <laughs> it's kind of funny because they have no idea what the website's about. But in November 99, we published our first page. I think you can find it on the Wayback Machine. I don't know if people have seen the Wayback Machine where you can look at old websites. And it's pretty primitive. Um, and we thought no one will read this stuff. It's just two guys talking about sports because no one else was doing it. But we thought nobody cared. We start getting a lot of email from people because Yahoo made us the hot side of the day after about three or four days of being launched. And that just made our traffic soar from you know me and Sid to 20 people or something. And we just start seeing traffic increments. The Village Voice sort of mentioned us as a hot site. And people just start picking up the fact that there was this website out there. Because the web was still so new that people would say, oh, here's this really cool website you have to see. Um, and so we got discovered by people. And then they start writing us, oh, are you going to write more than just the NFL? And are you going to write about gay athletes? And it was stuff that we hadn't really, we didn't have a plan. It was just two guys who felt like no one was addressing our needs. So we start writing more about gay athletes because stuff just started to percolate in the mainstream. Billy Bean, the former baseball player for the uh, Dodgers and Detroit Tigers, was inadvertently outed in the Miami Herald. His story wound up on the New York Times, and we start writing about Billy. Um, at the same time, an editor for a gay magazine wrote a very sort of titillating column about how he was dating a Major League Baseball player, but he would not identify him. And that became a pretty big sports story where everyone was trying to guess who the player was. And we probably had 20 stories on, on, you know, on this whole issue. And people start discovering us. We start getting asked for comments by you know, the New York Times and um, you know, mainstream media. And in 2000, in 2000 I wrote a, uh, an op-ed piece for the New York Times on you know, being a gay, uh, you know, being, it was called out at the ball game, you know, being a gay, um, you know, sports fans, not an oxymoron. And I submitted it to him on September 7th, 2001. And of course, four days later, on September 11th ha happened. And the editor said, well, this is not a good time to write this for obvious reasons, because people are preoccupied. And it ran a year later. But it was like we were in the New York Times with a picture one of our contributors had taken. And that was sort of a sign that, well, people are actually really paying attention to this issue. They were kind of fascinated by it. There were so many rumors about Mike Piazza, who was then with, I think, with the Mets, that he had a press conference where he announced he was straight, which was like the first time in history an athlete called a press conference to announce he's not gay. Uh, rumors about Troy Aikman had been going on for years. And it was all this stuff we were writing about. And at the same time, we started writing about young athletes who were coming out who were not necessarily stars. And they played <laughs> sports as varied as cross country to volleyball to swimming. We've probably done maybe 30 or 40 different sports over the years. And one story led to another. And so we kind of became, we kind of jokingly referred to ourselves at the time as ESPN for homos. It was like, if you want to read about sports, you want analysis, you want commentary, you want opinion, you want pictures of hot jocks or something, we're the place for you. And we kind of made a go of it. And I mean, I was telling John before, my all-time favorite story, just from the fun angle, what happened in 2005 when the Patriots unfortunately won the Super Bowl. And one of their players was named Randall Gay, a cornerback. And his music professor at LSU wanted to buy a Randall Gay jersey with the word gay on the back. So he went to the NFL online shop, and you can make personalized jerseys. So he typed the word gay, and it was rejected as being an offensive term. And I found out about this. I said, this is really strange. So I went on their website and typed in gay and got the same message. I then said, hmm, I typed in Hitler. I can buy a Hitler NFL jersey. I typed in gay Nazi. I could buy a gay Nazi jersey. I typed in bin Laden. I typed in a whole bunch of jerseys. And I was able to, and if I wanted to, buy the jerseys. So I did screen captures of all of the jerseys like Hitler and bin Laden and gay Nazi. Made sure I put them, I think, in Patriots, Eagles. Of all the teams I hated, I kind of made sure those were the jerseys I put the teams in. And then contacted the NFL and said, like, why is this allowed? And they didn't have a really good answer. They gave me some kind of spin about offending the sensibilities of the community. And I said, well, there's nothing wrong with being gay. So I wrote a story, and it got exploded. It was on the front page of a lot of sports sections because it was just a bizarre story. Everyone picked it up. 
And at the same time, some sharp computer program was on the site and somehow discovered in a file that was somehow publicly accessible the 1,100 words you are not allowed to put on an NFL jersey. And if you want to see all the examples of bad, dirty words, it, you can find them on outsports.com. The list is still there, and it's amazing. Some of the words that were not allowed, and one of them was gay, one was lesbian, it, it, but it was just like the scatological dream if you were like into that kind of stuff. And that's what got, that probably got a million page views just because everybody was clicking on it. It was like catnip. And it turns out this wasn't done by a computer. This was done by people who actually had to ask each other, hey, Joe, is such and such a dirty word? And they would look it up. And you imagine these guys at the end of the hill trying to figure out all these swear words. And the next day, they changed their policy and allowed gay uh, on the back of jerseys. And some reader bought a jersey and proudly you know, sent us a picture of him. So that was the, kind of the most fun story. But it was also a story that showed we had some clout that you know, the NFL changed the policy because Outsports wrote something. And then when Brokeback Mountain came out, there was a scene, I don't know if people, I mean, if you've seen the movie or not, but there's a scene uh, Thanksgiving, and there's a football game in the background. And me, who was more the big sports fan, noticed, that's not an NFL uniforms in the back of the, you know, why is, it, why, why is, the, why is there a non-NFL game on Thanksgiving, because the only games on are NFL. Turns out it was Canadian Football League footage because the NFL wouldn't license footage to their film. And I thought, oh good, another juicy anti-NFL being homophobic story. And I dug into it and I, the producer of the movie, Diana Osana, was one of the people basically claiming discrimination. I called the NFL and this time they were ready. They had documented the whole thing and it turned out they gave rights to the movies to virtually nobody. I mean, it didn't matter what the movie was about. This had nothing to do with gay. This was simply, I think they licensed it to some Disney film, but like nobody got NFL rights and that's why they went to the Canadian Football League. And Diana was running around kind of screaming homophobia, so I actually took the NFL side in this story and, you know, Diana kind of backtracked from it. So it was like, and then she, the day after she won, she won the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay and called me wanting to go to lunch. I had a wonderful lunch with her and I kind of thought, I just kind of ripped you online and made you look kind of silly and yet you went to lunch with me. So it was kind of fun. She's walking around with her statuette at our table in the Beverly Hills Hotel and I felt like I was a celebrity myself because everyone was coming up to congratulate her. So those kind of stuff that sort of made you feel you're, you're, you're doing something. And I'll fast forward it because I know John wants to get off the questions, but then Michael Sam came out last year. And Sid, my business partner, is best friends with Howard Bragman, who is a publicist in Hollywood. Howard was contacted by Michael's agents at the time. Michael wanted to come out, wanted to come out publicly, and wanted to do it before the NFL draft. And Sid's first question was, can we have the exclusive? And Howard said, no, I have to. He parceled it out. The ESPN got the broadcast. New York Times got the sort of mainstream and Outsports got the behind the scenes story. And so I worked with Sid. We had dinner with Michael the night before. And so we had our stories ready. And the, the embargo was 8 o'clock Eastern time on a Sunday. And at 8 o'clock, all you know, the New York Times, uh, ESPN, and Outsports all released their Michael Sand story. So we were sort of at the forefront. I mean, Sid more, to, more so than myself because of his connection with Howard. And it was just wonderful to kind of really feel you were sort of a, you know, a part of the whole story. And this was just two guys who 15 years earlier had just started a website kind of on a whim just because we want to talk about sports and had no grand vision or plan. And we've been owned for the last three years by a company called Vox that does SB Nation, which has about 400 blogs. And they've just been wonderful to us. And that, that came because the New York Times did a profile of the website in 2011. And someone from uh, Vox saw the site. And it, it, it's been a wonderful labor of love. It didn't make a lot of money when you're just trying to do a website yourself. So we make more with Vox. Um, and they've just been great partners for us. So it's kind of like they kind of kept out sports from probably dying. Because at some point, we, we would have got sick of making no money from it. And it's like, yeah. Uh, but this has kind of kept us both going. And now, as John said, with the Indiana thing with the religious freedom law, it's caused a huge firestorm. They were not expecting this. Um, Pat Hayden of USC, the athletic director who has an openly gay son, announced he's not going to the, there's a meeting of the college football playoff committee in Indianapolis, and Pat Hayden's refusing to go. Uh, Charles Barkley said they should take the Final Four out of Indianapolis. The governor of Connecticut's preventing 
a state-sponsored school who gets school money from using travel funds to go to Indiana. So, I mean, even today as we speak, this is, you know, this story is still really big and relevant in sports and, and society, and I don't think it's going to go, go away anytime soon. So with that, I'll leave it up to John and answer any questions. Well, thank you. The Indiana um, situation actually sort of touches on my, my first question, which is a fairly broad look. I mean, as somebody who's been covering um, gay-specific sports issues since 1999, um, what are some of the biggest changes or surprises you feel like you've seen over the course of that when you look, when you look back to 99 and you look at where we are today? What strikes you as, as the biggest changes uh, on the beat? I think easily nobody denies that there are gays. I talk, the, the big, men are still more fascinating than women for people in this, because the sad part is most people think, well, if you play sports and you're a woman, you're a lesbian. So they get discriminated against that way. So the men, and the reason I'm focusing on men is because for the media, that's, that's captive to them. I mean, when Brittany Griner came out, She's one of the best basketball players in the world. She came out, it got attention, but not much. Jason Collins came out, he's a bench player. He actually came out, wasn't even on a team. He was mentioned by President Obama at a press conference. I mean, so you have the best basketball player in the world, maybe as a woman. It's kind of like, oh, big deal. It's a, it's, a, it's a lesbian basketball player. As Bill Maher said, knock me over with a feather. You know, and then you get a guy who basically wasn't even in the league, and he's the big, the big thing. So in some way, if I'm sound like I'm focusing on men, it's simply because with the media, that's their fascination. Like they go crazy, and I think the the biggest change is the fact that nobody denies that there are gay men in every sport in the world. It used to be people would say, well, maybe they're not there. Well, everybody knows they're there. We know they're there. Other players know they're there. It's just that they're not coming out. But that's a big sea change. It used to be almost denied by people. And now nobody denies it. And Michael Sam said he knows several NFL players who are closeted. And Jason Collins said the same thing about the NBA and Robbie Rogers in soccer. So, um, and Billy Bean in, you know, in baseball. So that's, I think, the biggest change. People don't even make the, um, they don't even make the argument, oh, they're not there. Right. Um, just to sort of follow up on that thread, um, I think it would be interesting for people here to understand sort of your relationship to gay players in the major sports. Um, I guess the question is whether you have a lot of contact with them or do you get what's the situation as far as as information i mean are you the keepers of many many secrets that you will one day you know reveal in a lock you know come out of a lock box or something or you know how, how does that work actually we're not and i think it, jason collins um told us that he read out sports for years before he came out but if you're in the closet the last thing you're going to do is contact a gay sports website even, a, even sort of off the record, because you're afraid. You're afraid, what if we decide, you know, Tom Brady, we're gonna out you. You know, I'm just joking about Tom Brady. But, you know, um, that, that, that idea that, you know, you, that if a big name came to you, you couldn't keep it a secret. We hear names all the time from people, but there's always, you know, and I, they're believable, but we don't really have a lot of those deep, dark secrets just because the athletes are so in the closet. We know they read us because we are told by other people they read us, but they don't really want to go the next step. Like Jason Collins said, he got a lot of inspiration about reading uh, an MIT baseball player came out. You know, MIT doesn't have a great baseball program, but this guy's story really spoke to Jason Collins, and it was one of the things that made him motivated to come out. So I think, I, I think in a sense, yeah, people are kind of, well, where's all the dirt? It's like, you hear rumors all the time, but it's not like we have any necessarily more access we have some to some other athletes that aren't stars, but yeah, the big names, you can probably do web searches of most people and find scuttlebutt about probably at least a half dozen. You touched on one of the things that I think uh, is, is most interesting about what the site does, which is it will very often, I mean, today when we were, in, we were Jim visited a class this morning, and the lead story on the site was a backup uh, high school football player in Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. In Phoenix, uh, who um, uh, who had come out and was sort of telling his story. 
uh, with some regularity, you have athletes who decide to make this decision and 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 tell their story. How how has that developed? And you, do you have any sense of how many people have come out on the site at this point? We've had, if you want to call them exclusives, well more than probably 150 athletes have come out just on out sports first. And it's a lot of young athletes. It's mostly men, but it's some women. And it, unless you identif self identify as LGBTQA, whatever, the public or the media, especially, is not going to accept that you're gay. You have to sort of announce it. Uh, Johnny, where the figure skater was gay from probably the day he was born, and we knew it in the in the gay world. That was one we did know, but until he came out, which is after he retired, he was not referred to as an openly gay athlete because he wasn't. So we have a lot of you know, especially young people who want to let people know, hey, I am out on my team and it's fine, and and it it is it empowers other people. So one story leads to another. And we often hear, um, th today's story is about a high school football player in Phoenix. And he came out on social media. Uh, he photoshopped a picture of himself. And the headline said, sorry, girls, I'm gay. That was his coming out. And so I interviewed him, his coach, his mom, and his best friend. And he did it because he wanted other people to know, hey, you can be a football player. You can be openly gay. And at least in my case, it's accepted. Well, he was inspired by a soccer player that came out in high school by dancing at the prom with the prom king in West Virginia, of all places. And then he was inspired by Robbie Rogers coming out. And, in, and you know, so everybody is inspired by somebody. So we get a lot of people who want to tell their stories, not so much to get attention, but to say, hey, this is possible, and I'm there. And they invariably get often hundreds of emails from people. Um, we had an exclusive in December on the first openly gay umpire in Major League Baseball, Dale Scott, who came out and put an email address and then said he was stunned at how many emails he got, especially from younger people and one 17-year-old who wanted to be an umpire and was going to give up his dream because he thought he can't be gay and be an umpire. And now he said, I may suck as an umpire, but at least I know if I don't make the major leagues, it's not because of my sexual orientation, because baseball has been great with Dale Scott. I mean, Bud Selig sent a wonderful um, letter of you know, statement after Dale came out. So that kind of stuff, that's why this stuff is done, because you had a 17-year-old kid thinking, I can't be a major league umpire, none of them are gay. And all of a sudden, Dale Scott, who's a crew chief, who's worked the World Series and All-Star Games and been in the league for 30 years, he can do it. Well, good, that gave me more inspiration. And, and Dale said that was like the one email that just touched him more than the hundreds of others he got because it was like, wow, I made a difference in somebody's life. So that's what I, that's the thing of the website I like the most, it's those stories. And I love when they write them first person um, just because it's much more powerful that way. And we take a lot of care in editing them and shaping them properly, but you know, it's amazing how articulate people are about their own lives and often more articulate than I am. So. Um, that's, that, that's why it's been a labor of love. So even when we had these times when money-wise was like, well, we're not making much, it was like you have the satisfaction of somebody saying, I came out and I'm happy now because you have a website. And it's kind of like, it's a cliche, but you can't put a monetary value on that. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, the, about Dale's story. Because one of the things that Outsports, and, and you can talk about this as well, is Outsports doesn't out people who do not want their sexual orientation to be known. And uh, Dale is a good example of the ethical choice you have made um, as far as when to publish and when not to publish. Yeah, we, we've known Dale Scott's been gay for at least 15 years, maybe, maybe 12 years. Uh, because he would go to bars in Phoenix and in Denver where we knew a lot of people. And he was out, I mean, he, was, he never hid within baseball that he was, had a partner, but he never sort of announced it publicly. Um, and we would know it and it was like, well, until he comes to us and wants to talk about it, that's just simply a secret. We actually had another umpire, a gay umpire, who wrote a column for us on baseball rules. And, um, you know, I knew his name, but he, again, was never going to come out. Anyway, so flat, fast, uh, fast forward to this September, and Referee Magazine is a small 40,000 circulation, subscription-only magazine that doesn't put most of its stories online. They had an article on Dale Scott, just his career, 
Dale Scott's a great guy, you know, former disc jockey, one of, you know, great storyteller. And nothing about his personal life in it except one picture of him and a person described as his significant other named Michael Rausch. And an, uh, an umpire who subscribes to the magazine saw it and wrote me and said, ah, Dale Scott just came out in this magazine. And I contacted the magazine, got a PDF of the thing, as I, it's by subscription only, and sure enough, that was there. And I thought, I have a dilemma. I could write about this now because it's a public, you know, public periodical. Dale Scott's out. But he's going to be starting the playoffs next week with the Cardinals and the Phillies. I'm sorry, Cardinals and the Dodgers. And I know this could be, I know the media, this would be a story. First opening game, Major League Umpire. Maybe the timing's going to be crappy for him. And I don't want to just spring it without Dale knowing I want to write about it. So I got his email, and wrote a really long email explaining the situation and said, I don't want to screw you, but I'd like to do a story because you're now out. He wrote back and said, this is a terrible time right now because I've got the playoffs starting in three days. But I can't stop you from doing your job. I understand. And I wrote him back and said, would you talk to me after the season? Give me an interview so I can so I could do more than simply say, he came out in Referee Magazine. And he said he would. And so I honored that. But I did say, if someone else found a Referee Magazine article and wrote about it, I have to write about it. And I missed my scoop, but I could live with myself because it wasn't going to affect him. And nobody else saw it, which is amazing in this day of social media. Like nobody else picked up on that. Um, and so in November, I contacted him, and he gave me one of the best interviews I've ever had, more than an hour, and was very expansive about being gay, why he was doing this, the experiences he had. It was a much better story than I would have had by simply writing a blurb about Referee Magazine. But the story was also about how I got to the story. It was story a story within a story. And I was surprised at how much feedback I got from other writers and other people saying, that was really sensitive to the way you handled that. I was really impressed that this day and age, people go for the scoop. And I thought, I just don't want to do something that's going to make the, guy, make the guy's life miserable. And he's gotten a ton of attention from it. And it came out in December when it's the off season. And now, I mean, season starts Sunday. And I don't know what game was be doing, but it's been a non-issue for him. But that was an example where you have to balance it. Because if you out somebody and they're not ready to be outed, even though it shouldn't be this way, their life could potentially be ruined in certain circumstances. So that's why you need them to affirm, yes, I am gay, yes, I am lesbian. And so every story we have in before it publishes, especially if it's, it's a first person, it's like, are you sure you want to do this? Because once it's published, we can't, we can't reel it back. And so we have to take that extra step. And we've had people that were ready to do it and got cold feet and just never ran it. But we're never going to out anybody just because it's you know, it's, it's your decision whether or not you want to come out. And practically, it would hurt us journalistically because they would be like, you can't trust these guys. You tell them a secret and they're just going to blab it to everybody. Um, you know, and it's simply not the right thing to do. Just got a question. I'm curious, you know, what kind of like negative, do you get negative feedback often? And if so, you know, how do you deal with that? I read the. <laughs> I had this one in my back pocket. Yeah, go ahead and read the. Um... So I, I wrote the story on the high school football player today, and I got this lovely email this morning from FM Bill, Mr. Wannabe Gay Turd Columnist. On behalf of 97% of Americans, shut the fuck up with your gay tarred articles. No one wants to read about them. No one wants to read them. It's just too bad your parents weren't gay because then you wouldn't be here to spread your gay, ugly, evil lifestyle. Sincerely, FM Bill. So at least he was polite enough, and that's some of the feedback we get. Fortunately, it's a very distinct minority. It's not that much, but it was like it was a perfect timing for John with, you know, he asked that, and it's like, yeah, that's some of the stuff we still get because. Yahoo will sometimes pick up our stories. They picked up the high school football player. So you got the Yahoos on Yahoo, and it's one of the worst places for comments. It's a cesspool. And I had to go in before I came to John this morning and delete a lot and have my business partner delete a lot because we don't moderate, pre-moderate comments. And for all I know, there's stuff up there now, and so I have to scurry back later and go through it. But you know, so Yahoo drives a lot of traffic, but it also drives a lot of idiots and people like that. So yeah, that's, but in a good sense, that's very minimal. We don't get a lot of that, but you know, the stuff like this happens, we get it. 
Um, I, I just kind of want to follow up that quickly. I mean, obviously, there's a, you know, he's dropping an F-bomb and he's, you know, doing all sorts of stuff that you're not supposed to do in, in comments. But um, when we were talking earlier, and this is a little bit about Outsports sort of line between um, uh, uh, an edge of advocacy, but also journalism. The um, the harm that it could do to the player, um, you know, to have all have all the anonymity. Well, fortunately, this player has really thick skin, but I didn't want him to be reading all these things. So I said my business partner was out, kind of just. You know, hide, we can ban them or hide them. I tend to like to hide them because I can go back later and capture their IP address if it becomes a problem. Um, there's only one time we really got pissed off by an athlete that we kind of did something that kind of embarrassed him. And I can tell the story briefly. Yeah, uh, we used to have this little segment called Picture This, and it was simply a link to somebody, an athlete we thought was hot. And they would, the picture could be in Sports Illustrated online, it could be the NFL, it could be anybody. And it would simply give their name and give what position they played for. There was nothing sexual about it, it was simply, but it was one of our most popular features because it was kind of like, you know, you want to look at a hot picture, out sports will have a good athlete a day. So we picked this guy who was a triathlete named Sebastian Gacon. And it simply said, Sebastian Gacon is a triathlete from Switzerland competing and whatever. And it was a picture of him competing. And I thought he was a pretty hot guy, so he was our picture of this guy. I started getting a series of emails from him saying, take, the, take my picture down. I'm not gay. We wrote him back, your picture's not on our site, a link is on your site. Go to triathlon.org website and have them take it down. And he started getting more and more nasty. I'm not gay, I have a girlfriend, and everybody thinks I'm gay. And I said, well, no one said you're gay. You're on a gay website, but Brett Favre's on our gay website, and nobody thinks he's gay. So it kind of went on and on, and so I said, okay, fine. I'll satisfy you. So I wrote a story, and the story's headline said, Sebastian Gacon is not gay. And the whole story was basically Sebastian Gacon is a very straight triathlete from Switzerland who was clearly not gay as he told Outsports in a series of emails. And it just went, went in that venue. And Deadspin picked it up, and their headline was Sebastian Gacon is definitely not, 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 10 knots gay. And it was all this play on how super heterosexual Sebastian Gacon is. And now I kind of have a bad thing after that because now if you type in his name in Google, at least recently, the first thing would pop up were these stories about Sebastian Kakon not being gay. But he just, he would not, he threatened to sue us and it was, was, was silly, but it was just so annoying. It was like, okay, fine, you want to go this way, so we do that. And we wrote a very factual story. We, we, did, we said he's not gay and he has a girlfriend, so he's not possibly gay. But I think the only time an athlete has really kind of upset us. Right. Now we've had one athlete actually the first pro athlete that contacted us to, in support of gay rights was Connor Barwin of the Philadelphia Eagles. So if you're an Eagles fan, Connor is a great guy. He has an openly gay brother. And when Obama gave a support for same-sex marriage, I think that was, I forget, 2012, yeah, 2012, Connor contacted us and said, I want to talk about this issue. I'm passionate about it. And he gave a great interview where, you know, he spoke you know, so lovingly about his brother Joe and their family and, you know, so I'm a huge Connor Barwin fan and I hope he does really well with the Eagles this year. Other questions? Jeff. I'm curious as to whether you think that projecting out a number of years that Outsports as a uh, needed website, if you will, would be eventually become outdated the point where readers have read stories about that's coming out would say, not That's a good question. People thought that when Jason Collins came out, and they thought that when Michael Sam came out. And we have nobody in the NFL is openly gay, nobody in baseball, nobody in hockey, nobody in uh, basketball. So I think we're not anywhere near the critical mass of enough big names or just names coming out. Um, I would think, I would hope that the generation of the students here, by the time they become general managers, scouts, and owners, it's such a non-issue that yeah, I mean, but I think it's going to be a while. And I'd be actually thrilled if the site wasn't needed from that vantage point, because that means, you know, people sort of moved on. But our traffic continues to go up because you see this Indiana stuff. This is a big story right now. I mean, so everybody's talking about Indiana, and sports has been a big driver because these religious bills have been in so many other states, but they haven't had the NCAA Final Four in them. But yeah, we get asked that every time an athlete comes out, is out sports necessary anymore? And it's like, well, as long as people are still being, you know, yelled at for being gay, we have a, one coming up tomorrow about a basketball player in Kentucky who was, a, you know, had his team bus assaulted by kids who were you calling them faggot. 
um, and his team rallied around him. So as long as that kind of happens, but yeah, that's a good question. But I, I think it's still going to be for, for not for a while. I'm curious. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have one? Yeah. No, no, no. Well, actually, Rose in the back was at first. Um, Buzzer, so good to have you. Yeah, you too. A <laughs> um, few things have happened while you've been away. One of them, uh, Reddy Portland finally um, left as yes. uh, coach of the women's basketball team here at Penn State. And uh, as somebody who worked with a lot of students and staff to hasten her departure, for those of you who don't know, Reddy Portland was um, racist and homophobic. Bas women's basketball coach here for many years. And uh, a film was made about her called Training Rules. And her training rules were no drugs, no drinking, no lesbians. Yeah. And um, in the wake of the Sandusky scandal, and I'm, I want to be very careful about how I ask this question, I have thought several times, the AD who hired her, of course, was Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno. Um, and I'm aware that we are in the Paterno Library right now, which gives me a creepy feeling. Um, but in retrospect, I wonder if a same kind of willful ignorance was going on about Rennie Portland's training rules that was going on in other contexts and athletics here. And if, if you're willing to venture into that territory with me, I'd be grateful. Because it's something I'm writing about, trying to write about, and I think about a lot. Well, with Rennie, just simply that, I mean, she got a lot of attention for it, but she was winning. And so I think as much of it being fired, at least in my mind, from an outsider was as much as she started to lose, uh, you know, as addition to that kind of stuff. But you're trying to make, is there a link between that and what went on with the other? Certainly in terms of uh, what happened to Rennie, some of Rennie's athletes, mm -hmm. and what happened to young boys, no, I don't see yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. no link. I'm talking more about a mentality that would have somehow maybe washed its hands of the consequences of that kind of ignorance for marginalized people in both situations? Yeah, I think, I think that's true, but I think in Rennie's case, it was, there's still a lot of late, uh, quiet homophobia in women's college basketball. I mean, there's a, there's a term they call negative recruiting, where a heterosexual coach will talk to a recruit's parents about his family values his team has and trot out his pictures of his wife and his kids, or if it's a woman, her husband and her kids, with the implication that, oh, this other team does not support family values because it's either a single woman or a, um, you know, implying she's a lesbian. And so that still goes on because there's no Division I um, women who are openly gay. And yet that's one where we do know of several big time names who are definitely lesbians. And so they still fear that. So I'm not sure it's a Penn State thing as much as it's still sort of a sports thing. And I'm not sure Sandusky was necessarily a Penn State thing as much as it was somebody who in many ways had a guy like Joe Paterno, who was bigger than life, sort of in charge. And then maybe this could have happened, I'm not being an apologist, could have happened in other places with a similar set of dynamics and circumstances, more so than necessarily Happy Valley. Let me, uh, let me sort of take that thread and, and, and go back to professional sports. Do you get the sense that um, the NFL and the other major sports leagues right now are sort of in a period of like, hey, right now we don't have to deal with that. And um, let me just start there and I've got a follow up. Yeah, I think in part because there's nobody out right now, so there's nobody they have to deal with. When Jason Collins came out, they had to deal with it. When Michael Sam came out, they had to deal with it. So I think, if, in, I think in sports minds, okay, we've done that. That was last year. You know, this year in the NFL, it's you know domestic violence or something, which is you know for them actually a more problematic thing because there's more incidents of that. But I think the sports leagues they've all adopted policies, they've all done the right thing, and they've all set up a structure so players can openly come out. I mean, there's no player is going to be cut openly because he's gay, um, but there's still clearly a culture there that makes people not comfortable to do it because guys aren't doing it. They simply don't see an, I think it's mainly, they don't see an upside. And I think the biggest reason in my mind is you can't come out quietly. Right. That if you were say, because I'm a big NFL fan, if you were the third string safety for the Tennessee Titans, maybe one of the most obscure teams in football, and you came out as gay, everybody would know who you were. It just, it's a huge thing. 
And so you couldn't just drop in, oh, by the way, I have a boyfriend without that becoming the lead. So I think for a lot of guys, they don't want to feel they have to run the gauntlet of being the name brand gay athlete. Um, and a lot of it, they're young, and so they're still figuring out their sexuality. A lot of non-athletic people come out later in life. Even today, they may come out later in their 20s. And the careers are so short that I think they think, OK, I can deal with that after I retire. And then when we retire, we pretty much forget about most of these guys anyway. So I think there's that dynamic in sports that they feel they've set up. The, the good news is they've set up the foundation for it being accepted. I mean, Roger Goodell has a gay brother. So it's not like they're overtly going to be that way, but you're right. They had they kind of said, okay, we did that last year. There's an interesting dynamic too in that. So Sam initially before the uh, before coming out is projected as a fourth round pick. He winds up as a seventh round pick, yeah. and we discussed about the fact that he sort of underperformed in in uh, in preseason, and you can make an argument about um, whether that's. Um, you know, whether his being cut by the Rams was about sexuality or whether it was about performance on the field. But fourth round versus seventh round, you're talking about a difference in salary of about $300,000. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really big disincentive if you're going to drop three rounds in the NFL to, to come out. I think he was, I think he slipped because of him being gay. I just am convinced. I can never prove this. I also believe he was taken by the Rams. There was a deal with the NFL. They, it would have been so bad PR for Michael Sam to go undrafted. And he wound up picked 249 out of 256 to the Rams, who had an extra three picks from the supplement. They have a supplemental choices. So they get seven picks plus they got three extra ones for I forget how the supplemental draft works. So they had extra picks to work with. And he's in St. Louis, or he played in Missouri. I can never prove it, but I just had this feeling that there was some deal like, geez, can you, can you take this guy and, you know, because the Rams' strongest position was their defensive line, and they took a defensive lineman, because um, it would have been really bad PR for him to drop. And so I think him being gay had something to do with him dropping in addition to how he performed at the Combine, but it just seemed to me, you know, really unusual that someone who was projected so high would slip so far. I mean, it happened, it does happen with players, but you know, and this is, this is the whole thing with Michael Sam. No one could ever prove it because he's, he's not J.J. Watt. If he was J.J. Watt, it doesn't matter. He'd be on a team. He's a marginal back of the roster player anyway. So how much did this gay, fa gay factor into it? Sid, my business partner, is convinced he's not in the league because he's gay. I think that's a factor with some teams, but I don't think it's the, the only reason. I think some of it is he kind of doesn't fit what a lot of teams are looking for. But it's one of those things that if you can go back and replay history and Michael doesn't come out, is he on a team now? I think that's the big question we'll never know. Your question. There's an MMA fighter in Britain, I forget his name, um, who I think is dating woman, but has done quite a bit of gay porn. Um, and Eric Anderson, the sports sociologist, has said, this has sort of been a non-story in Britain. Um, and that's a sign that Britain is four to six years ahead of the US on how scared of homo homosexuality people are, um, and how scared of gay athletes people are. And I've, I've been thinking about what Anderson says about that, about Britain being four to six years ahead of the arc that the US is on. And sometimes I think he's about right, and sometimes I see evidence that it's not that. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, Eric Anderson is also known as Coach Gumby. He was a track uh, coach in uh, Southern California who came, was out as a track coach, wrote a really good book about him, and is now a professor, so I don't know what it's like, gay sports studies or something in, uh, in England. And he, him and his husband lived there. And, Hey, I didn't know about the guy doing gay porn. I, I got to call him and find out who is this guy because we'd write about him. Um, I think he's wrong on that. I think we're actually ahead of Britain. I mean, we're further ahead in American pro sports than the English Premier League. It's, that's a cesspool of racism and homophobia. And Robbie Rogers, who played in the, in the Premier League, said he would never come out there. He's comfortably out in the MLS, which is certainly not on that level. but. Um, I think Britain's behind the U.S. in that. Um, uh, they've just started to attack homophobia, but 
it's just a more visceral thing in England about you know there's I mean they have they have chance that you know uh, they've had anti-gay chance about certain players it doesn't matter if they were gay or not um, and that hasn't been happening in NFLs you know in NFL stadiums about it so I kind of disagree with him on that I think in the case of the guy who's doing porn you know I that's happened before there have been guys who've done gay porn who were married and nobody seems to care it could be that he's in a sport that still isn't as huge um, relatively to the, to the American team sport but I think we're kind of ahead on that issue with compared to a lot of the rest of the world especially international soccer yeah uh, I want to get your thoughts on the Skip Bayless and Troy Aikman thing that happened a few years back, and uh, also your thoughts on journalists that out people that aren't at, uh, like Skip Bayless did in his book. And, and what do you think about that? It, that? I mean, he basically wrote that Troy Aikman was gay when he didn't really have that much to go off of. Yeah, the Troy Aikman is gay things have been around for 20 years, even before Skip Bayless. I mean, Barry Switzer, the former Cowboys coach, alleged it. Um, a, we don't believe in outing. We just have never outed anybody. And Skip Bayless can be a real jerk. And I think what he did to Aikman was, you know, not professional. Um, on the other hand, I think Aikman still seems really bent out of shape about it. To even recently, he gave some answer that I don't, you know, I don't, I have to look. I don't live that lifestyle or something. And it was kind of this churlish response. It wasn't. Hey, there's nothing wrong with being gay. It was almost like, how dare you say this about it? And I want to punch Skip Bayless in the nose. So, kind of, I've never been a big Aikman fan for that because he's always seemed to be peeved by it as opposed to kind of laughing it out. I mean, he's Troy Aikman. He's got millions of dollars. He's well loved. He's a national analyst for Fox. He doesn't have anything to worry about. So, people want to say he's gay. What does it matter? Uh, but Bayless, I think, was totally in the wrong on that for doing that. Uh, because he didn't have any evidence. It's been one of those things that have been rumored for years for various reasons. But, you know, again, if Troy, unless Troy Aikman says, I am gay, um, as far as I, my mind, he self declares a straight, he's straight. But, yeah, kind of, it's one of the things where I kind of didn't root for either guy. You know, like, I don't like Bayless doing that. I don't like the way Aikman's response was. Because um, he talked, to, oh, he called it a choice. I've not chosen that lifestyle, and that really pissed gay people off because it's not a choice. So Sid wrote that story. His headline was, Troy Aikman says he's chosen not to date men. That was his spin on it, just to kind of piss him off. But, um, you know, so you got some people really cool about it, like Connor Barman. Like, you, if you told Connor Barman, he'd probably say so. He had a, he had a shirtless picture. Was it, uh, who's who James Bond? Uh, Daniel Craig. I think he had a shirtless James, Daniel Craig poster up in his thing just because he's a bit of a goofball. And he didn't care if guys thought, you're gay because he's so comfortable with himself. Uh, but guys like Aikman just seem there's an edge there, and I don't know what about it. Yeah, but I, we do not agree in outing. I mean, Aaron Rodgers came out last year as straight after rumors started about him being gay because his former personal assistants are tweeting some stuff that seemed to indicate they were having a lover's quarrel. And it got so hot and heavy in Green Bay that, you know, Rogers went on radio and said, I'm not gay, I really, really like women. And that was his, the way he's addressing it. And now he's dating Olivia Munn, so take that for what it's worth. I'm curious how you uh, would assess, you know, like the national media's coverage of, you know, take Mike Sam, for example. There was the whole fiasco with them reporting on, you know, his shower and his schedule. And, uh, you know, do you think that's an issue on a large scale, or was that just for ESPN? What happened was ESPN had a live remote with Josina Anderson from Rams Camp, and she, off the top of her, started talking about Michael showering habits and how it was unusual because he showered alone, he didn't shower with his teammates, and it was so offensive because A, I didn't know, is Michael unique? Do all the Rams shower together as one big happy group of 95 guys soaping each other up? I don't know. But she made it sound like there was something weird. And she didn't have anybody on the record. She just said, quote, but yeah, he, he showers alone sometimes. And it, was, it brought up the thing, is this weird fear of the locker room. Um, I, one woman once said that the US has the cleanest soldiers in the world because they're obsessed with showers during the whole don't ask, don't tell. It was all about the shower, showering with a guy. And she said, we must have the cleanest soldiers. All they're talking about is having showers together. So that was actually a, the Michael Sam, I thought, actually, for the media, handled it pretty well. That was a rare example, and she got really slammed from it, and she's kind of chagrined. It's also the problem of ESPN having going live. Everything is live. She had nothing new to report about that, but they had to go live because it was like she's giving you breaking news. And she talked off the top of her head and kind of made a fool of herself. I think if she had had a produced segment, they may have said, 
that didn't work. Let's do, let's not even go there. But she just kind of went in this tangent and, you know, she got really slammed for it. I know she feels bad about it, but uh, that, was a, that was as much about ESPN and the way they run things. I mean, you know, if Tim Tebow ever came out as gay, oh my God, ESPN would spin off its axis. So, I mean, you know, that's this example of certain things ESPN just beats to death. And you can tell, you know, if you came from Mars, you could tell that Michael Sam was the gay guy on the Rams because he was the one not in the shower with yeah, exactly. five other guys. He was the dirtiest Ram. <laughs> um, but as a whole, do you see, um, uh, when in the totality of, of, of the media, do you think that the, how, do, how would you evaluate the, the, the treatment of gay I think the media has actually been very good about it. I mean, think about it. Who's going to write a story saying a gay player doesn't belong in X sport? Nobody's going to take that point of view, and they're very supportive. I just think there's such a frenzy that the feeling is if you're, you know, when Brittany Griner came out, that got a little attention. I saw when Jason Collins came out, Barack Obama's talking about it. So I think it just, everybody wants a piece. TMZ is dying to get a gay player. That is their big mission in life, is to get an out player. Um, and so they stock bars and they stock, you know, everything just because it's the way TMZ does things. So there's still this fascination. So I think the media has a great job, but just the totality of it can seem like way overblown. And when Michael Sam kissed his boyfriend, I mean, it was like they say, Twitter blew up. It was like this huge story. He kissed his boyfriend and everybody wrote about it. I actually did, was live on the BBC that night, of all things, and they were, as they say in their British term, gobsmacked that the ESPN showed it. And because it was a great, it was to me the sports photo of the year last year was Michael kissing his male partner. But, so you can see if you're a gay athlete, do I really want that attention? You know, I can't, you know, so I'm not blaming the media for it because I think they do a good job, but I think there's so much of it that, you know, you kind of have to go through, run the gauntlet for a few days. But the story does die down. I mean, Michael Sam's story died down. Once he got drafted, it flurried up for a few days. He went to training camp, one or two day story, and then pretty much for the six weeks of training camp, there weren't Michael Sam stories every day. It was occasional thing, but it wasn't a big deal. And the Rams said, Jeff Fisher, the coach, said he was not a distraction in the slightest. And I believe him. One just observation is that you can see reporter fatigue sometimes creeping into stories. This is limited to Michael Sam, it's all stories. But um, when they start to write stuff like, and the Rams could finally focus on football, yeah. that means I'm tired of writing the yeah. story. <laughs> And I would like to write about something else now, please. Okay. What do you think will what What do you think it will take, or who will it take, to make these not these national stories anymore in the in the pro leagues? Probably a big name, a superstar, you know, or two to come out and say I'm gay, and thrive and excel. Um, I was asked, I interviewed by somebody from Grantland, the ESPN site, about the Michael Sam photo. And he said, what's your dream? And I said, my dream is one day we'll watch the Super Bowl and the next day we'll be that commercial with the MVPs running off the field. And he goes, where are you going? And he goes, I'm going to gay days in Disney World with my boyfriend. <laughs> and that to me would be like the moment, like it's so natural. And so I think it would probably take a star to do it to sort of survive because let's suppose Aaron Rodgers was gay. Well, he's such a good quarterback, he's not going to get cut by the Packers or anybody of his, his um, skill set. So I kind of think more so, or just a critical, a critical mass of people to the point where it's like, oh God, we, that's the 10th guy that's come out this month, we're sick of it. But it hasn't happened. Um, so people say the gay Jackie Robinson, well, there really isn't a good example. Jackie Robinson had actually a lot worse things going on back with the color line back in the 40s, but he couldn't hide. Gay athletes have been around forever and they could hide. I'm very good friends with Dave Copay, who came out in 1975 after a nine year career in the NFL. And he's been wait, he's been, he told me he didn't think he'd be waiting 40 years for someone else to sort of come out. There have been a few guys since then, but um, so to answer your question, I think it would just take, you know, the, the big name, a big name coach, big name player, somebody that's like, whoa. And I think that would probably be the thing that starts cracking the ice. If anybody has one more, do one more question. I'm just curious, we, 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 you started off by saying obviously the media pays a lot more attention to gay men than to uh, gay women. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also curious a, as to uh, why, that, why that continues to be the case. Is it basically 
just the high profile of men's athletics versus women? Think, kind of, it's, it's, in some ways, I think it's the overall sexism still in society. I mean, women at the short straw in so many things, and in sports, they simply aren't covered as much, they aren't valued as much. And so there isn't that fascination. And then you take the dynamic. I mean, how many strikers have told me, God, the idea of two lesbians getting it on is so hot. And yet, oh my God, two guys touching each other and they want to puke. I mean, lesbianism is kind of cool with straight men in some ways. You know, it's almost like a fantasy for them. So if lesbians come out, that's OK. Um, and everyone assumes women have to fake the stereotype the other way of you know, being an athlete. Like the LPG, LPGA commissioner got in trouble a few years ago when he wanted them to dress up nicely, wear nice dresses so they seem more feminine to sort of get away from the reputation of it being a lot of lesbians. Well, that was an offensive thing to say. And so I think a lot of it is that, that there's simply more coverage of men. There's nothing the equivalent of the NFL in women's sports in terms of the amount of interest. But I think a lot of it is, you know, women still have to fight their own battles and their own stereotypes with this within sports. And, you know, men's kind of dominate, men dominate the media, and I think that continues to be the fascination. You look at ESPN, they have a site called ESPNW, which in some ways is kind of ghettoizing women's coverage. You know, it's kind of like, it's a side, and the stuff often isn't put on ESPN.com, and you know, so they have some really great writers there, and yet the stuff is on a site that kind of it's like, oh, we do it because we have a women's site, so we can not be accused of not being, you know, pro-woman. So, I think that's a big a part of it. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming oh, all the way from California to see us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.